Misty Copeland, thank you so much for speaking with Forbes. Thank you. So we are speaking at an event dedicated to mentorship among women, and you wrote an entire book dedicated mm -hmm. to your mentor, Raven. For those who have not read it, who is she? What do people need to know? Yes, Raven Wilkinson um, was the first and only black woman to dance with this legendary company, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. It was really one of the most important ballet companies of the 20th century. Um, she experienced um, severe racism, her life being threatened, um, just so she could get on stage and perform. This was whenever the company would tour through the South in the 1950s. Um, she went on to become a soloist in the company, which is such a feat as a dancer, period, but as a black woman, even more so. Um, her career was cut short in America because of, uh, you know, Jim Crow South and segregation um, and in that time. So it was just too difficult for her to tour with the company in that time. So she ended up moving to Europe where she finished her career. Um, she came into my life um, at a very critical time in my career where I was, uh, you know, at a crossroads of figuring out um, if this was something I wanted to stick with and do in classical ballet. I was the only black woman at American Ballet Theater for the first 10 years of my career. Um, and to have uh, a mentor come into my life and set such a positive example for me and constantly come from a place of love um, was a very new experience. Um, you know, I've had incredible mentors in my life um, and examples from afar, but um, it's hard, you know, you develop a tough skin when you're the only, and when you've um, come up against this wall, you know, over and over again, being black and brown in an industry that you don't see yourself represented, and to meet someone who um, had such a positive outlook on, um, on this, field of classical ballet and what was still possible. It gave me a completely different perspective on um, where I wanted my career to go and how I was going to approach things. Um, that it was about being an example and being a role model and um, and being open to this idea of mentorship, both being one um, and having them in, in my life. How did you find her? What was the mm -hmm. moment? Because I think for me, mentors have come organically. It's been someone who hires me and I end up trusting mm -hmm. their advice or someone who edits a story and I like the edit and right. then I realize I, I keep going to them for counsel. Yeah. What was the evolution for you? Um, so I saw a documentary with Raven in it and, um, and it just, it was eye-opening to see someone who um, had experienced, I mean, so much worse than I could ever even imagine, you know, that I've experienced in my own career. But to, um, to see that there was still so much that hadn't changed, um, I just felt that I, I needed someone like her in my life to communicate what it was she experienced and, and be um, a source of community for me and at a very important time. And so my manager and I, um, we were on a mission. We were like, we have to find this woman. We hope she's still alive. Um, and found out she lived a block away from me in New York City and um, and reached out to her. And the first time we met was um, at a panel discussion about two different generations of black dancers. It was at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And from there on, we were inseparable. Um, and it was just so, you know, important for me to, I think, understand the importance of mentorship. I mean, I've, I've had mentors, you know, throughout my career and have been um, so fortunate to have people that have come to me uh, and, and wanted to lend their advice and experiences. Um, uh, so I feel like all of that prepared me for Raven to be ready and open to accept all the gifts that she was giving. A block away, talk about meant to be. Yeah. What's your advice to someone whose mentor is perhaps not waiting for them a block away? Do you have mm -hmm. one tip for someone who's like, I feel like I need a mentor, I just don't know where to look? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the first step is, is acknowledging and, um, and accepting and being open that um, mentorship is important. I think for a lot of young people, um, 
they're, they're not even aware that mentors may be right there or approaching them because they're not open and ready for it or they feel like um, it's you know them failing or being weak by needing help or guidance or advice. And I think that's kind of the first step is, is accepting that um, having a, a community is empowering. Um, and then go out there and look, go out there and you know, whether it's um, reading, um, just looking in places uh, of people that motivate you, people that are inspiring and not being afraid to reach out and, and put in that, that legwork. And that's how I found Raven. I consider you a multi-hyphenate, obviously, ballerina, writer, but also advocate and activist. The last time we spoke was for the Forbes Women's Summit. I think it was the last time. I'll have to fact check this. But <laughs> the Women's Summit, a virtual summit in 2020, we were coming off a summer of social justice protests, mm -hmm. companies and individuals making all these pledges to do better. Nearly three years later, what's your report card? How's the world doing? <laughs> you know, I, I have to say that I feel like we're still on on a positive trajectory um, in terms of uh, changes really happening in the classical ballet world. Um, I, there's still so much that, that needs to change, but um, even just looking at a, a lot of top-tiered companies around the world um, who have had new artistic staff come on, artistic leadership, so many women have come into power in these classical companies that I, I think we have more women in um, artistic and executive director positions than I've ever seen in the classical ballet world in, in our history. Um, in terms of race um, and you know dealing with those, those issues, I mean, I look at there was an article that came out recently just about the evolution of um, allowing dancers of color to go on stage in tights that are their skin color. That's a true representation and acceptance of who they are on stage um, and not saying that you have to be white in order to um, fit into this classical ballet idea ideal. Um, and so that's a huge step, but I think that it's uh, continuing to having, have the conversations and hold people you know, accountable. And that's something that I will forever continue to do. It's, I've seen the appointments kind of behind the scenes. I am someone who frequents the theater in New York City and I feel like I won't name any companies, but there was one production where I was looking and I was like, I thought the company was more diverse than this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it feels like it's, maybe I'm impatient, you should be. You should be impatient. <laughs> I think that's how you, um, you know, you push people and 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 get change. But I don't think that we should settle in in just seeing a handful of uh, dancers of color. And then you know there there may be certain performances where all of those dancers are off, right. and that's not okay. Um, so you know, I, there's still so much work to be done, and. Um, and I hope that you know programs like the Be Bold program through the Misty Copeland Foundation will create a pipeline of more dancers of color um, to you know have a larger pool of dancers of color to choose from to go into these uh, classical companies. Speaking of Be Bold, I mean you wrote this in a book, but I think it might tie to the mission of Be Bold. You'll have to tell me if that's right. Mm -hmm. But you wrote to be marginalized from a culture is to be marginalized from citizenship. Mm -hmm. Does that tie to Be Bold? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's really about um, showing that ballet, it, it's normalizing this elite art form. It's normalizing it, especially in America, where, you know, it, it, going to the ballet or going to the opera, that should be like going to see Beyonce in concert. That should be like going to a basketball game. Um, this should be something for everyone. It should be a community that's, that's um, embracing all communities um, and all cultures. And uh, through the Be Bold program, which is an after-school uh, ballet program, it's for free. It's at uh, community centers right now. We're starting out at, at the Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, but it's, it's, it's introducing children to um, really understanding what classical dance is, what classical music is, by uh, meeting them where they are. Uh, so, you know, we're introducing them to live instruments. Every class has a live musician in there and two teaching artists as well. So there's a, a team of three people that are in the room so that they can really focus and nurture and be there for these dancers. Um, but it's not just about creating, you know, the next Misty Copeland. It's about 
um, creating uh, future patrons. It's just, it's about um, opening their eyes to this art form and showing them what's possible. It's igniting, um, you know, what it is to be a part of a team, what it is to have focus and determination and drive and, um, and uh, to be dedicated to something, to find a passion. And I think that this is a beautiful gateway to doing that, to creating future leaders. It absolutely, I have a theory, and maybe this is because I danced as a kid, that ballet infuses you with so many skills that mm -hmm. you can use. I talked to so many founders and leaders, yes. and we get to talking, and they're like, oh yeah, I danced all through college mm -hmm. too. And there's, it's the discipline. Yes. I, we could have a whole separate <laughs> conversation, but talking about how the skills of ballet translate to other things. I don't want to use the R word because we're here at an <laughs> event talking about how careers are evolutions and have yes. chapters, but yes. when your body is your instrument for your job, there are certain limitations. How do you think about the evolution of your career? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is something that's always been uh, a part of my evolution, um, is, is thinking about how I can utilize, you know, all that I've learned by being a classical dancer and taking it a step further. I've, I've never looked at my career as be, being on stage, being the end all be all, but um, just a, a, you know, another layer of, of what it is to, um, to have the responsibility of carrying on you know, so many people's legacies and stories as a black woman um, within this field. And so I've been working on what the next steps in my journey will be. Uh, I feel like I've been doing that, that work my whole professional ballet career, and I'm never gonna leave this behind. I may step down from the stage eventually, um, but I will forever be an advocate and bringing uh, you know, ballet into different worlds that I'm in, you know, whether it's through the foundation, whether it's through my production company, where we're um, show, giving a different perspective and lens to what it is to be um, an artist, um, real authentic stories by having people behind the scenes telling those stories who have lived that experience. Women of color um, telling important stories, but it's all connected to my experience of being a ballet dancer. And I'm just so fortunate that I've had people who have pushed me to step outside of my comfort zone um, and think about what my evolution will look like. I think you're setting the stage beautifully, but when you think about the way a body can change. Mm -hmm. We've had women on the 50 over 50. Lillian Cologne was the first Latina Rocket. She mm -hmm. was on, and she, then she was in West Side Story, yeah. and uh, then was the oldest person in that cast, made the 50 over 50. So I know you can dance into your 60s, 70s, and 80s, but the way you dance changes. And yes. I think that I've experienced that myself, and it's hard it's hard. It's hard. How do you? How do <laughs> it's you? It's hard at forty right now. <laughs> um, it's you know, of course, it's about taking care of yourself and and um, and you know, I'm I'm an athlete and and you know, taking care of my body in a way that um, you know, whether it's what I'm feeding it, fueling it. Um, the cross training that I'm doing, the the time for recovery and and healing, but I think it's also um, it's also like a, a preference, you know. I want to um, be able to use my time in a way where I feel like I can have impact in other ways, and I feel like I've I've you know I've been on the stage for 23 years, and I feel like. I want to give this opportunity now to the next generation. I think it's about passing the torch and, and being able to put myself in a place where I can have a, a, a big impact as well. And I feel like that's kind of um, what it, where I'm getting to right now. I see that. And I think you can pass the torch both ways. I just mentioned Lillian Cologne. We had Joan Myers Brown with Alan oh Lango on the list. Yes. I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, but who would you nominate? From dance or otherwise, for the next class of 50 over 50. Oh my goodness. Um, Virginia Johnson. She was um, one of the first principal ballerinas for the Dance Theater of Harlem um, in the 60s. And uh, she took over Dance Theater of Harlem as artistic director when it uh, came off of a seven-year hiatus. 
after Arthur Mitchell stepped down, um, who was the founder of Dance Theatre of Harlem and the first black principal dancer for New York City Ballet. Um, she's an incredible woman who has made such an impact, not just on the black ballet community, but on the ballet world at large. Well, we will consider that nomination for the 50 over 50. And with that, we will let you go. Misty, thank you so much for sitting down with us. Thank you so much for having me.